I'm grateful to your priest today for inviting me to be here with you and to preach and for her ongoing encouragement uh, as I uh, struggle with uh, what it means to be retired. It's good to be here, and Paula, thank you again for your collegiality, your friendship, and your love along the way that we travel together. In his recent book, Starry Messenger, Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization, Astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson invites the reader to step away and find a new perspective on our complex world that will inform and transform our understanding of the past, the present, and the future. He writes, after thinking deeply about how a scientist views the world, about what Earth looks like from space, and about the magnitude of cosmic age and of infinite space, all terrestrial thoughts change. Your brain recalibrates life's priorities and reassesses the actions one might take in response. No outlook on culture, society, or civilization remains untouched. In that state of mind, the world looks different. You are transported. You experience life through the lens of a cosmic perspective. Whether peering through the lens of a microscope, standing atop the strata of a hill, or soaring a quarter of a mile, million miles through, away through space, we as individuals and we as a people desperately need to find that strategic cosmic vision that will impact our relationship with the past, the present, and the future, and the decisions we make. Zacchaeus found such a perspective in that encounter with the Messiah that day in Jericho. Zacchaeus was not a well-liked citizen of his community. Not only was he a tax collector for the occupying Roman authority, he was unscrupulous in the way he went about carrying out his duties. He looked upon, was looked upon by his neighbors as a traitor and a cheat. He was also vertically challenged. It's no wonder that when Jesus came to town and the crowd lined the road to see him, nobody offered Zacchaeus a front row position. He couldn't see what he needed to see. So he ran to a tree along the road and climbed up it so that he would be able to see what he could not see from his obstructed view on the ground. And everything changed. In that encounter, Jesus redeemed the past. Zacchaeus uh, was a man who had quite a past. And before Zacchaeus could ever begin a new and better chapter in his life, he was going to have to bring another chapter to a close. Well, for most of us, there are great experiences along with sorry experiences in our past. For Zacchaeus, the sorry experiences seem to have far outweighed the great ones. Whether the experiences are the result of our own behavior or the harm done to us by others, both the good and the bad moments of our past can be an obstacle to our present and future lives. Hayes and G. Werner wrote a book called And We Are Whole Again. In that book, there's an interesting chapter called Nailing Up the Back Door. And in that chapter, Werner explains that achieving fullness of life requires learning how to nail up the back door of life and how to walk away from some of the experiences of the past. After all, the history of God's self-revelation is the history of persons who have been brought into confrontation with their pasts 
and learned that new life requires the death of the old life. Amid all the liabilities of the past, there is one great asset we all have in common. We have a gracious God who is full of compassion and pity, who is not easily angered, who shows great love and faithfulness, and who sent the Son to seek out and to save the lost. We can nail up that back door of our lives because we believe he has both the power and the will to redeem our past. There in that crowd, estranged from his neighbors and his inheritance, from God and himself, stood Zacchaeus. Nothing was left for him now but the frustrating attempt to somehow deal with his sorry past. Things that had happened to him and things that he had done to harm others. Jesus changed all of that. He assured Zacchaeus that he could walk away from his past, nail shut the back door, and live the sort of life he was created and called to live. Jesus accepted Zacchaeus. He enabled Zacchaeus by the force of love divine to accept himself. And thus, Zacchaeus repented. He made restitution for those he had wronged and committed himself to leave the past behind. It is significant that the text records that the tree Zacchaeus climbed was a sycamore tree. That type of tree in the Middle East is not like our sycamore trees here in Texas. It is a fruit-bearing tree, but its fruit is bitter, and in order to be enjoyed, the fruit must be pricked before harvesting so that the bitterness can be drained out. Jesus pricked the soul of Zacchaeus that day and harvested him like the fruit of the very tree he had climbed. Such divine redemption of and from the past is just as possible for each person, for the nation, for families, and for the congregation. In that encounter, Jesus transformed the present. When Jesus comes near, his reign touches our life. That's what we mean when we talk about entering the kingdom of God. That is the essence of our salvation. Our lives, with all the bitterness of the past stored up within, are pricked and redeemed and transformed in our encounter with Jesus. Because of this salvation, our lives are then able to bear fruit that is ripe, delicious, and nutritious. A preacher who's a friend of mine has a wonderful way of putting things. Some time ago, I heard him say to a congregation, the past is gone. Tomorrow hasn't come. Today is all we've got. So live in it the best you can. That's the gospel. That's the message of the gospel as it came to Zacchaeus in that encounter that life to the fullest is available to you and to me today. I believe Zacchaeus was ready to hear that word. He had heard that wherever Jesus went, he brought life to people who were dead on the inside. Jesus recognized that Zacchaeus was ready Because of all the people along the road, he was the only one determined enough to overcome obstacles by climbing a tree so that he could see Jesus. He was asking a question when he climbed that tree. Can he bring new life to me? Sooner than he could have ever imagined, Zacchaeus received an answer to his question. The Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. Here, to say that we're lost doesn't mean that we are doomed or damned. 
It means to be in the wrong place. In the same way that in my house, when an item is lost, it usually means it's simply in the wrong place. When we find that which is lost, which is in the wrong place, there's usually a lot of rejoicing. I'm not very impressed with the question of some so-called evangelicals who ask, have you found Jesus? The gospel really doesn't ask that question. Rather, it makes the affirmation that Jesus came to find us when we're lost. It is an ancient biblical and theological principle that God always takes the first step. It is God who always finds us. We may be looking, as Zacchaeus was looking for Jesus that day from the top of that tree, but Jesus found Zacchaeus, and he finds us as well. The joy we know when we're found by him is almost indescribable. Think back to the time when that happened to you. Something you never really forget. You don't want to just take up residence there and live there forever. But that moment of transformation comes and it changes things. Not just with the past, but the present. He finds us and proclaims, today salvation has come to this house. Today salvation has come to this house. When we encounter Jesus, he transforms the present. And then in, in that encounter, Jesus offered a compelling vision for the future. When we contrast our life as it has been with what is it is intended to be and choose the latter, life as it will be is going to be affected. The future is going to be different because we've made some strategic decisions about the past and the present. The eminent 20th century preacher Harry Emerson Fosdick put it this way, Jesus' attitude toward human personality can be briefly described as always seeing people in terms of their possibilities. He habitually looked at others in terms of what they might become. In Jesus' approach to other persons, it has always been future possibilities that mattered the most. Jesus wanted Zacchaeus to make some decisions about his life today that would radically redirect the influence he would have on the world tomorrow. Clement of Alexandria, one of the early Christian fathers, said of Jesus, He turned our sunsets into sunrises. Zacchaeus was watching the sun set on the dead-end street of his life when Jesus came into his life and redirected his orientation so that suddenly he saw the sun rising on the highway into God's future. It's ironic that the same Clement of Alexandria recorded the tradition that Zacchaeus became the bishop of Caesarea. We can't say with any confidence what actually happened to him. We can, however, say that with confidence that when Jesus offered him a compelling vision of a better future, his life and his impact on the world around him was changed. In his dramatic essay, The Mirror, Lloyd C. Douglas has a scene in which Jesus and Zacchaeus are talking. Zacchaeus, said the carpenter gently, what did you see that made you desire that peace? Good master, said Zacchaeus, I saw mirrored in your eyes the face of the Zacchaeus I was meant to be. Maybe you've been thinking that you already were the church 
you were meant to be. And perhaps you're right. However, circumstances have made it impossible to continue to be that church. You've been in a process of discernment, tantamount to climbing up into a sycamore tree to get a strategic perspective on things, trying with all your might to see in the eyes of Jesus the church you were meant to be and the difference you're meant to make in the coming era of mission. Following this service, we'll spend some time together in that ongoing process. In the epigraph for his book, Dr. Tyson quotes Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar D. Mitchell's reflection on his own cosmic perspective. You develop an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world and a compulsion to do something about it. From out there on the moon, international politics looks so petty. You want to grab a politician by the scuff of the neck and drag him a quarter of a million miles out and say, look at that. So as you discern the person and the church you're meant to be with the passion of Zacchaeus, get yourself up to where you can have such a cosmic view and look at that. Look into the eyes of Jesus and see who you were meant to be.